Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And um, beautiful city and wonderful audience and everyone I have met, the friendliest place. Really so terrific. So, so much fun to be here. Um, well, hmm, interesting. We are talking about experimentation. It, it struck me that finally, though, uh, what it arrives to for architects are rather unusual things. That is, our goal in discovering all of these remarkable things that are happening technically and um, the capacity of these things for, for us, the architects, finally is to bring them into physical form to reconsider space according to these explorations, to apply them. Architecture is an applied art and science. And so I am absolutely committed to understanding the capacity of these forms, but also to understand how they bear on our lives and what they might mean for people living in these buildings and such. Issues have brought me to consider far more uh, the reception of these things. So the, the lecture is a little bit different, although I must say I, f I fear it will bore you to some degree given the extraordinary and fascinating things I have been seeing in the lectures, the discoveries. Uh, these, um, these things might seem rather ordinary. Also, I will be sharing many projects with you and, well, you know lectures that show projects. They're always limitedly interesting, but um, <laughs> so be it. Uh, let me um, explain where this is coming from. Uh, it begins with this, you know, with this. Um, let's go back to this, if, if, if you will allow, because I think the idea of the ready-made, you know, is absolutely fundamental to much of what we're doing. Um, but not for the simple reasons that maybe initially we think about. I want to call attention first to its iconoclastic function. Let's not forget, try not to forget, <laughs> that, you know, to put this in a museum was a very extraordinary, even violent assault on the most venerated, legitimizing institution that there is, the Museum of Art. Uh, and um, it meant completely reconfiguring the definition of art, the artist, authorship, what the role of craft and production are, what the role of technology is. Here, we are looking at what was then absolutely contemporary, mass-produced, uh, you know, an exquisite form, comparable even to something as beautiful as a Brancusi sculpture, ripped off the wall, defunctionalized, we're preparing someone to piss in a museum next to a Manet painting. Uh, you know, it's a very extreme act. Of course, having rotated it 90 degrees, having taken it off the wall, you know, it is displaced from its function. This defunctionalization, such an essential aspect of the ready-made, ripping it literally out of context, well, there are many other issues to raise, but I want you to think about that one because this is what will make it impossible for the ready-made to really make sense for architecture. This defunctionalization. You understand that when we defunctionalize an object, we are left only with its formal attributes. Well, initially, that would be what it would seem we're left with, and that would be a problem for architecture that it would turn only into form. But for art to turn an object like this into form was a very critical act. How is it then that architecture can ever be critical? We'll come back to it, but first let me 
talk about this question of authorship and the signature. Of course, this was a fake. You know, this was a pseudonym which only called more attention to Duchamp himself. Now art is really a theory of art, and it is a theory attributed to the artist and centrally focused on the, the, the particular sensibility of the artist. What is the artist in the ready-made world of art? The artist is the person who makes the choice to turn an object into art. But the object is already made. It's made by the larger society. It's ubiquitous, mass-produced in this case. So it's a very interesting intersection of undoing the, art, the, the, the author. Let's say the old author, author of art is the one who crafted and composed, you know, the genius artist casts all of that aside, but puts even more emphasis on the mind of the artist. The artist as the person who thinks about society, thinks about technology, and knows how to select from it correctly to make us aware of it in particular ways. So this is a fundamental turn. You know the displacements and combinations the fetishization of things that we wouldn't normally pay attention to, but the choices, the particular strategies, and this continued all the way, of course, up until, or it continues to this day, here is a kind of, uh, let's say, um, late 20th century, later 20th century Jasper Johns. You know, this question about the defunctionalization, it was already on the minds of the founders of the ready-made idea. Here is Picasso turning, of, as you know, a bike seat into the portrait, into a portrait, uh, well, into something else, and understanding that someday, once again, it might function, but in some other way. Fordist production, not post-Fordist, as the subject of art kitsch elevated to an extraordinary, beautiful, beautifully uh, crafted artifact, engrandized, monumentalized, this kind of material transformation, which is absolutely essential to bringing the ready-made back into the world as art, reproducing the reproduced, there are many strategies, this is Sherry Levine, and architecture entered into this too. But how does it do it? Well, this is the most kind of uh, iconic example. This is Adolf Loos for the Chicago Tribune selecting a column from the past of architecture, but misusing it at a scale that means it is not the object it had once been, it has been reclaimed. Rescaling is absolutely one of the primary strategies of the, of the ready-made. Other very clever ready-made architects. This one extruding a figure horizontally, that is the figure of this clock. The horizontal extrusion of a skyscraper was actually quite a remarkable thing to do, to take a profile and extrude it that way. As you know, usually a skyscraper extrudes vertically. I'll come back to the extrusion. You know, this is another brilliant idea by Hans Holine, to make the skyscraper correspond with a very different machine, the automobile grill and become a symbol of its corporate identity, branding at an urban scale. Now he understood something very important in, the, in this montage, which is also represented here by Christo, that it's the context that will define the idea of ready-made in architecture. The problem for architecture relative to art, I think more than anything, is that Art has the capacity to act against the institution. 
the legitimating, legitimating institution of, of the museum, for example, or other institutions of legitimation, whereas architecture does not have this context. It has the city, and the city is something else normally. It isn't so easy to understand it that way. Of course, there are other problems with critical acts in architecture. They are acted out <laughs> uh, de by deploying the resources of the people they are critical of. This, of course, is the most crit uh, difficult. So they have to be sublimated acts, or only represented, as in this case, or temporary. There were other things that happened in architecture that correspond to ready-madeness and that geniusly capture essential questions of it, but do it in such a sublimated way that we wouldn't understand them that way. It's only through an act of interpretation that we come to know them that way. So for example, this gigantic obelisk, which is actually a structurally reasonable answer to the problem for a giant skyscraper. And this is scaleless but very specific representation of the idea of extrusion in a skyscraper by virtue of the shape of the plan, the profile extruded, recollecting quite interestingly Super Studio's horizontal version of it for New York here only represented owing to the fact that it isn't endemic or let's say reasonable to produce buildings horizontally extruded normally as it is to extrude them vertically. So Harry Cobb on the left is trying to take what is normal about architecture and turn it into a ready-made by calling attention to when it's a, one of its essential foundational properties, that of extrusion. Look how similar the idea is to these. Everything is extruded, of course, by this point in the 1970s. Here we're taking ready-mades and performing acts of violence on them, quite literally splitting, for example, Matta Clark, the house he found. You know, buildings are something like ready-mades already. They're already ready-made, and this is the problem. Architects inherit forms, patterns, principles, conventions that they do not author. They have to inherit and work within them. And transforming them into ready-mades thematically is very difficult because it requires breaking, of course, from the kinds of conventions and tastes and values that built all of these already ready-made things. And they have to make ready-made things, already ready-made things, somewhat unreasonable. It didn't seem so reasonable that a kitchen should have as its floor the asphalt of a driveway. Well, it doesn't to many people seem reasonable, but it can be. It can be done, Gary would say. Gary, of course, appropriates the idea of the ready-made in more than one way. Here, working with an artist you know well, uh, but in his own work on the right is taking the structural buttressing and turning it into sculpture. In a way, the, for him, architecture turns into a ready-made by becoming art, by becoming sculpture. Architecture becomes the subject matter of an artistic practice for Gary. But this is another approach that is quite interesting to turn engineering into something that can perform the task of building what I would call a kind of geometric ready-made. You know, this idea of building this gigantic sculpture of a geometrically pre-composed form. It's a kind of monument to the author's power to mobilize the resources and, <laughs> and to dictate an incredibly monumental feat of engineering. The author becomes something 
not so, well, let's say parallel to the idea of Duchamp, an author whose presence as a thinker is what is most evident in the work, not as a composer. There's one more aspect before I show you my own projects I want to mention about ready-made in architecture, which is fascinating. You have with the ready-made also, and given this idea that you're dealing with buildings that you inherit the behavior of, you have in it another type of transformation that occurs already, and that is the distortion that is brought to bear on particular norms normative patterns, a distortion which, when it is found, is more often than not the product of the city, of the forces acting on these forms in the city. Here, of course, we have this wonderful example in the foreground of the Barclay Vese building whereby, wherein the, the plan is turned into a parallelogram. The whole building is turned into kind of a projective representation of a building just because of the shape of the site. Not voluntarily, but involuntarily. And you can see how the tower rising out of the top of it is square and normal again because of the resistance, inherent resistance of rooms and elevators and all of those things inherited to the transformation, to the distortive transformation that the city begs for. But we interpreting it, understanding as a projection, as a somewhat flattened, normal building, distorted, have mentally transformed it into a work of art, something akin to a ready-made, to some degree, modestly, that could be said. So architecture does it, but it has to be somehow related to circumstances, to the site. I'll come back to that when I show you some of my own projects, and I'll start by speaking only about one precedent, which is so formative for the museum in Tel Aviv that I'll show you. This being the Guggenheim in New York. Certainly, speaking to this idea of the ready-made, it takes, for example, this idea that it could be a geometric artifact, a spiral that could be the, the object found, set against the typical buildings of the city, displaying itself as if an object in a cabinet of curiosities <laughs> on the shelf of the city, something like that. A very remarkable, exceptional element among all of these normally cubic buildings. But what occurs as a result is what matters more, and that is how it acts on the museum. It's not just how it appears and its shape and its reference to the city and how different it is. It's what happens as a result to the museum. The museum now confronts really an organizational idea with, which inherits this idea of the picture gallery stacking paintings a high in very large rooms, but at a much larger scale, in a giant room, with a ramp wrapping around, giving us access to it, and putting people as much on display as art, turning people into artifacts on these, displayed in this panorama as much as art is, this kind of life art, you know, reconfiguration, very much related, of course, to Dada and many other abstract movements of art. Um, it's a very compelling transformation. It also, of course, has other effects, not the least being a very radical division between two types of experience. One, the all-encompassing experience of the totality of the museum as a single giant room on the one hand, and on the other hand, the idea that the entire museum is a line a linear sequence. That idea becomes very dominant in museums, that they develop an itinerary 
And I would indeed say that Guggenheim was foreseeing this very specifically important organizational principle of linear narration of space, drawing it out from the sidewalk and up into the building, but in this case so remarkably, as I said, unifying it all around a single vessel of space, which is itself an artifact in the city, an extremely distinguished artifact in the city. We were trying to do it again, but in another way, because there was a different question that began to emerge after the Guggenheim, and that was how to make spaces of a, with a great deal of flexibility. As you know, a lot of museums are just composed of boxy rooms made to be as flexible as possible for the curators. Why should architecture dominate and, and have so much power over and above curate, curatorial efforts and artists? And so we put in this museum the two models together, the museum of boxes and the museum of linear, linearity and continuity to see what kind of museum that would give us. It's done because of the city. Here again, the city is the force that actually makes it to some degree, apparently to some degree, involuntary. It would seem to me more compelling when it's involuntary rather than merely done willfully. So this was done, let's just argue fictionally, to solve the problem of the site. Here we have the rectangular galleries piled up, a whole set of you know, rectangular galleries, six. And they will engage in the making of this central space, the ruling lines of which uh, are generating hyperbolic paraboloids, which altogether give form to a space which, space which will reflect light down to the lowest reaches of a building which is half underground. The building had to be half underground in this particular context. So it's both problematic because the site is almost a triangle and needed to have flexible rectangular galleries in a triangle and because it's half underground. And this is how we composed this space which of course required a remarkable kind of construction. And here you see the dialectic of the cubic galleries and this remarkable unifying experience because there is another, yet another dialectic important about the museum today, and that is that it be a place of public perusal, wandering, aimless, unpredictable social encounters, events and happenings and parties and, and many other things, and it also needs to support what happens only in galleries, spaces of contemplation for art. There's the gallery. These are the plans piling up and generating that remarkable kind of space at the center. And these are the facades which reflect the same geometry put to a very different use, which is to establish a sequence around the edges of this building, which finally lead one under and around it into an outdoor gallery. And so it kind of is exfoliating from the inside out as an organization, the whole museum. Very horizontal, low slung building, it would appear at first. And one would enter, it, one does enter <laughs> like this, uh, and then discovers I hope and I believe for many it's quite unexpected, still for me it is when I see it, how deep, plungingly deep the building actually is and that one is actually in the middle, in the middle of the section, halfway up, halfway up in this single space, this space that reflects light um, in a very studied and careful way and introduces 
cool and, uh, versus yellow light, a duality of coloring, of color temperature that is essential for distinguishing the two realms, the realm of exhibition from the public realm, the public realm of wandering. There are the generators that are the edges of all of those straight galleries, all those strict rectangles, which seem to turn one over the other, crisscrossing bridges, the, the extension of those galleries. Now I will speak to what I call the critical encounter with architecture. A very unexpected and wonderfully unexpected thing happened after the building opened. The new director, Suzanne Landau, arrived to a very different idea about how to curate in this building. Rather than focusing all of her attention on all these wonderful, flexible galleries at her disposal for any kind of exhibition she would wish, some of them as large as 10, uh, sorry, 1,000 square meters, a really nice size for that kind of installation work. She really kind of just let those galleries sort of slumber and went to work on the light fall. And I started receiving phone calls from people who were, went to visit the building. They were alarmed to see what was happening. They're ruining your beautiful space, they would call and tell me, friends of mine. Someone said, there's a monster in your building, inhabiting your building. Uh, it, it was really quite astonishing because we had not considered, though we had considered the possibility of some installations, we didn't expect this. You see, what happened with Suzanne was she was very disturbed that people were coming to the museum to see the architecture. And she said, I'll be damned. They're not going to come to see the architecture. And the only way that she could be ensure that art would be the primary, the primary attractor for her audience would be to attack the architecture itself directly. And that's what she did. She brought artists who would fundamentally alter, some in very beautiful ways like this, but probably the most remarkable, the most remarkable intervention just occurred, the, the exhibit only recently closed, was this. <coughs> and I have to say, the calls, well, this is the one where really people called me, they were just oh, absolutely horrified. And I went to visit. I had to be there for another event not related to the museum. And I called Suzanne, and she was very fearful of my reaction. She called me. She said, you know, we must talk. We must talk. Let's meet outside. I said, what do you mean? Why should we meet outside? <laughs> she wanted to prepare me. Now, I, it will sound disingenuous, maybe. But I have never been more thrilled. I mean, I, I have to say, it was, it's absolutely beautiful. It is sublime. It is everything the space isn't. It is now dark. It is ominous. It sounds differently. The acoustical properties are utterly different with this in it. This inversion of everything this space was meant to be it becomes a critical act in the context of the museum. Architecture enables art to behave critically once again, I would argue here. Oh, oh, sorry. What I would like to also suggest, and I thought I had another slide, was that it had also done something very unexpected to these artists' works. If I were to show you all four of these installation artists' other projects, you would see, I think arguably, that this space has done something that none of the others have. Not only because it's shaped so strangely is the Vasconcelos piece such a monster in this building. Not only is this one, you know, behaving sculpturally, in a compelling way that it does not in any of his other sites where it, he's always got normal shaped rooms to hang this material on the walls of. Not only then, therefore does it have sculptural impact, but 
I don't believe in his other projects that when we enter a single gallery and encounter this material, that it is an act against architecture. It isn't, in fact. And there are many other museums, I would argue, where specially shaped rooms are places for art and do not make art a critical instrument within them, but rather pictorialize the art, establish a kind of picturesque environment for art. And that is not what I want to do. I do not mean to make the museum a context which is sort of a picturesque backdrop. It is exciting to imagine the museum as a place where very different things are happening, so extremely different that when this occurs in a space, it is an act against architecture. Architecture wins, though, by the way, because this goes away. <laughs> it's temporary. <laughs> Now, you'll remember architecture could be ready-made if it was temporary. So this is a very interesting idea to invert the critical relationship. I just, uh, now, I'm just showing you a couple of other, I mean, this is a, another museum. Uh, this one's in uh, China. It was done around the same time, uh, a little later, a little later. Um, very opposite problem a site too open, too undefined to pressure anything to happen. There could not be anything involuntary about this. It would all have to be composed. This is for sure. I brought the itinerary, the linearity into it. In this case, cutting it through the building itself. This is a path that makes its way through the building in such a way that one can witness some of the most important spaces of exhibiting art on the outside in sculpture areas, which initially it was thought, uh, you know, initially it was thought that these should be very contained and only seen by visitors to the museum, not passers through. So the only critical tool I had was to have the public encounter the museum in a manner which they would not do in, in other cases in China. That is by passing through it rather than into it. Turning the museum into a threshold in the city rather than a discrete and separated experience. Um, and yes, it is the strangeness of its formal configuration that does this. By the way, this is, is a quadrifoil geometry which has been extruded and rotated, generated by different techniques of panelization, discretization of hyperboloids again. Um, there you see an example of the panel, quad panelization, in this case of one of the larger hyperboloids. It happens again on the interior in the atrium. This time, though, much more like an exteriorized environment. And partly this is owing to the fact that in this context, the Chinese would like very large atriums for very large ceremonies. It's much tougher to introduce the kind of compressive force that Tel Aviv has, for example, in an environment like this. Everything has to be expansive, not compressive. <laughs> but on the margins, in the corners, certain things can come, come down to this. Very tight spaces, tightly wound stairs, very horizontalized galleries, shockingly horizontal from the mayor's point of view, disagreeably horizontal. Um, and, and then, <laughs> by the way, why is it so horizontal? Because ramps don't rise fast enough, and Chinese engineers won't weave ducts through castellated beams. They drop them below the beams. They can't integrate systems. It's inefficient. And so the ceilings just kept dropping. I wouldn't let my ramps go, and so they only would go so high. 
and these structures and mechanical systems are pressing down, the spaces became very horizontal. I was happy they did, but again, it's the adoption of necessities, inevitabilities, involuntary things that made it turn out that way. A library broken up inside by all kinds of different functional conditions, again, powerfully unified around atrium spaces, coiling through inside tetrahedronal assemblage. This is opaque glass for the most part. And a garden which applies the same idea of the atrium which you see here, but not with books, with flowers instead. Now this kind of compressiveness, this way of working with the city whereby it could be seen as something putting pressure on buildings. Here you see the High Line, of course, this famous space which is pressured that way, a restoration of a obsolete railway. Um, and then the tower on the left is Neil Denari, and, and then this canopy just below this downtown that I did next to the Goldman Sachs on the left, between it and a very ugly building on the right, a hotel, and the two were bending in plan happily in such a way you can see it there pointed to where I say arcade canopy. The, the site is bent, and so it will force this deformation of what would have been a singular surface, now crumpled, it's actually a triangulated hyperboloid. And it produces a kind of tenuous expression of exaggerated perspective. There are many effects that arise from these extreme proportions and these kinds of relationships of tension and pressure. Two buildings in the middle of a city in China called Xining, um, a kind of civic center and a, an educational building for the community there. The shapes of these totally made up, <laughs> um, but doing things with each other that bind them together into periodic patterns distorted in particular ways from the inside according to the variable programs. Just beginning construction. And then a science center, this one so overscaled, 65,000 square meters so unnecessarily gigantic. Well, thank goodness, <laughs> because then it could enclose, it could enclose the, the sphere which would contain this theater, um, a planetarium, and this sphere would be exhibited in, uh, in an atrium that bifurcates in order to accept it, to swallow it just inside the skin with my partner Carl Dworkin at the office we work obsessively on the development of the envelopes of these buildings the systems that produce these the optimization of these systems is our obsession optimization meaning standardization standardization that will produce sufficient variety to appear non-standard. Unfortunately, this will not be so visible as it is today, but it is quite beautiful to see the inside, of course, to see the inside of the spherical planetarium. But after the critical act of <laughs> the exhibition designer is undertaken, um, <laughs> it may not look so wonderful. We'll see what will be done to the outside of that sphere. But again, scale and the pressure it exerts is the essential, uh, the essential effect that happens. So context here 
I, you could argue, is this, this building of slabs and columns. The sphere is the artifact found. It's literally thrown into a context and alters the context, the architectural context. So actually, the, the planetarium itself is a kind of physicalization, an expression of an act of transformation against the museum, the figure of the museum or the normal slabs of the museum. You see it pressuring it. You see it taking effect in that context. This is a new building we just finished. It's an addition to a building. We've done many interesting additions. The Tel Aviv Museum is also an addition, actually. And the site is so much a determiner of what happened here. This is in the University of Michigan. There is this very large shed building that we're adding on to, that gigantic roof on the left, a kind of product of late Mesian architecture of that part of the world. Very tough, very regular building, which I admire, actually, for its relentlessness. <laughs> and then our building, which uh, is trying to make connections it can't even stretch to make, doing everything it can, too many things, trying to do too many things, establish a path through the university, stretch itself all the way up to that boulevard from this giant shed down here. Um, that shed down there at the bottom is the architecture school, and that new wing is trying to bypass that building at the top. That building at the top belongs to the art department, way up there at the top. So it's really hard, it's really hard to get this building, to get the, it's hard to get the, um, the new building, whoops. I should get the, I wonder if I can get this to work. Hmm. Not gonna do that, all right. Anyway, to, to, uh, to get this building to go past that, to get it to go past that wing at the top, to stretch it all the way up to, and have an address on that street at the top, which is the front, the new front door for the school. You see then that this is the whole plan of the architecture. This is for an addition to an architecture school. This now becomes the plan of all of the studios for the architecture school all together. And we're trying here to do something very strange, to create a center a centralized atrium that's actually on the edge of a building. And the sequence into this produces some very extraordinary moments uh, as we ascend through this tormented little building. <laughs> the building is only about uh, 40, I don't know, about 4,000 square meters. Um, and um, a great many things within it there are not there is not enough room to really accommodate and yet it was asked that we create this remarkable central space multifunctional very expansive and dramatic which would finally give the school an identity within itself that it never had because it really is only composed of pancakes of space so now suddenly it has this kind of very extreme interior at its heart, not at its heart, on the edge of the site, but now at the center of the life of the school. Difficult to make it both the center and the, at the edge. Um, and to have this light, again, the color of light, give it an identity that's so distinct from the other building by reflecting the light. Southern light reflected on northern opaque, opaque panels. Here you really see, see what happens. You see the, on the left side, one kind of space, and on the right, upper right, something very different being pulled together by this twist, by this exceptional stair. There's the reflected southern light. Too bright probably for students using their screens, but we will have blinds eventually. And the outside industrial typology, but altered by patterns, subtly and subliminally reconfigured geometrically. Here's the first critical act against the building, an installation, strange furniture by new young faculty in the school. Again, now in Instagram, they're ruining your space. 
It was time that I have to say they kind of are, but I don't mind. It won't be there forever. I'll pass by some other projects. A distorted gable that contains a theater. A dual figure that produces an opera house. And a new performing arts center in Bogota, Colombia, where we began only with cylinders, turned them into hypermaloids of revolution, and generated this dualistic stare that refigures the entire facade and the sequence up into the theater from a lobby below. Really interesting problem here, which was to kind of totally alter the normal distribution of functions because of the site, too small to contain this theater. Again, the site did it to us, and we were forced to put the lobby below, which caused many, many interesting things to happen. And you can see here how the lobby becomes a very grand space. There's the theater right above it. You can see in section how that extreme space is an extension of the plaza below rather than in front of the theater as had been initially intended. The lifting of the whole building up, it really made, stirred up all kinds of things. It stirred up all sorts of new, new ways to assemble spaces. The theater itself is more verticalized than typical. And this is the facade. Again, opaque glass and the canopy and the effort to standardize it and to assemble it with only three types of curvature, whereas the facade would be made of eight, I think, at this point. All cylinders. Here again, an experiment with the tension between standardization and variability and variation for a project that was exhibited in the Biennale last year. And finally, this is the last project, an experiment still, the beginning of the, of the composition for the Shimalam Institute, which will be dedicated to exhibiting different strategies for representing historic tragedies. A very difficult subject, and we're looking for ways to present the spaces of the museum, obfuscate certain spaces relative to others visually. And this has generated this very strange section, and this now is where the project stands. Well, I don't know what act against this building will be taken. Uh, <laughs> that has yet to be determined. But I only wanted to leave with just the thought that it is this unpredictable encounter after the fact that I think more often than not we should be attending to, at least as we further explore unprecedented forms. Thank you so much. I don't know if there's time for just a couple of questions or one. Or yeah, question. so uh, <laughs> thank you, Preston. Maybe there are some questions from the public. Room. So with regards to the idea of the ready-made, um, when you come up with a facade, uh, is it sort of with the intention that, like, you know, some act will be taken against the building? So it's just, like, it's where you're creating, like, a space for... Um, maybe something completely different to what you were expecting the function to have? No, I wouldn't say that, really. I wouldn't really put it that way. In fact, I don't believe that is the, the intention. In fact, I'm only reflecting on what has happened and beginning to recognize there are ways of going about doing things that can, I think, create the circumstances for acts to be taken that would seem to be critical of architecture. So, for example, in this museum, I think it has happened 
that art acts against the building owing to the way that space is situated, its scale, its character, and, and the way it is the identity of the building, the way it has such a significant role in giving definition to that building for, for many people. So to go against that or to cover that up or whatever is in a way a denial of what people desire about the building. Many people have gone to the building just to see that space and been disappointed that they're not looking at it. Um, and then they have to deal with something else which is really incredible, this sculpture, uh, which is in a way even more remarkable than the building they thought they were coming to see. I, I like the idea of situating things, uh, setting things up that way, but it's difficult in certain times, as you know, to do such, <laughs> to make that possible. I would say in the case of a science museum, the way the sphere is, you know, set in the context of the building, the scale of it, the magnitude of it, and the encounter with that object in that way is surprising and un unsettling. Um, and uh, there were quite a number of people you know, there in China we were working with were very doubtful that this was a good idea because they really thought it would make people feel uneasy to have this fear pressing in so much on them, <laughs> you know. This kind of discomfiture, um, you know, excites, I think, and creates more interest than backing up and seeing, you know, the map of the world on the sphere. In my opinion, it's more compelling to be in that relationship. So it's a matter of making the choice and creating the circumstances, the settings in, in which certain things are experienced in particular ways. As far as the geometry, the configurations, we're trying to create tension, we're trying to elicit a response. I mean, to have two staircases that are contained in two cylinders that are tilted against each other in a particular way makes moving in those spiral staircases, spirals that are actually shifting as they spiral and cantilevering progressively, creating some really tough engineering problems of their own in the process. Uh, anyway, all of those challenges are really only, let's say, dedicated to making the experience of ascending in the, or descending in the opera house a very extreme theatrical experience. Um, anyway, it is about creating experiences more than anything. Thank you. So uh, I think okay. there is a certain time we need to